This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Hinge. Every so often we find ourselves facing a crossroads when writing Word of the Week. Our garden path diverges and we, sorry we cannot travel both and be one traveler, must choose one. But usually, that sort of divergence comes as a result of the direction our meanderings take us. Rarely is it that we start off with two different paths. But this week, our word is a homograph. Sort of. First of all, let's cover the difference between homonym, homophone, and homograph. Both start with the prefix homo, meaning the same. But they actually refer to very different things. Homophones are words that sound alike, but have different meanings. Like two, two, and two or there, there, and there, or right and right. See? It just sounds like we said the same words over and over, right? That's what homophones are. But homographs are a bit different. Whereas homophones come from the same root as phonetic, meaning sound, homograph comes from the same root as paragraph, lithograph, and monograph. Graph means to write down, and so homographs are two words that are written that is to say spelled, the same, but they have different meanings, like flower, the plant, and minute, meaning one sixtieth of an hour. You'll work it out. As for what a homonym is, well that can get tricky. Some people say that homonyms are the broad classification for things that are either homographs or homophones. Other folks say that homonyms are a special case of words that are both homographs and homophones. That is, two words that are spelled the same, sound the same, and mean different things. For example, the word bow can be a sign of respect or the front of a boat. Spelled the same and pronounced the same, but different meanings. This is not to be confused with a bow that you use to fire arrows. While bow and bow are both homographs and homophones, bow and bow are only homographs. Got it? So today we're starting with a homograph. We could say hinge, or we could say henge, and both of them would have interesting uses in D&D. Of course, some might argue that those don't count as homographs, given that henge is a Japanese word and isn't usually written in the English alphabet. But those people would ruin our fun digression about homonyms and would also cheat you out of half of your episode. First, let's talk about henge. Henge is a Japanese word, and it refers to a specific type of yokai. Now, yokai is a very broad word. It refers to supernatural beings, spirits, demons, and ghosts from Japanese folklore. And also some that are not from Japanese folklore. See, during the Edo period of Japanese history, roughly from 1600 CE to 1868 CE, there was a major explosion of folkloric art. Many, many artists during this period took to depicting all sorts of yokai from Japanese folklore, and many artists delighted in inventing their own yokai. And over time, those invented yokai got conflated with true folkloric yokai. For example, the snake bird lobster called Emikiri was invented by the artist Toriyama Sekien for his book The Illustrated Night Parade of a Hundred Demons, which was published in 1776. And it was exactly what it sounds like, a collection of three volumes of demons, monsters, ghosts, and spirits. It was like a monster manual for Japanese folklore. Now, yokai come in several different classifications. We've talked about oni before, savage ghost ogres. There are also the tengu, which are basically demons. And there are the sukuimogami, which are animated objects that come to life and achieve sentience once they hit their hundredth birthday. Seriously. The first one was a magical tea set. And then there are the henge, and since henge are a type of yokai, they are often called henge yokai. Henge yokai are magical animals with many powers, including shape-shifting. And the funny thing is that in Japanese folklore, almost all animals were said to have magical powers. For example, the fox, or kitsune, was a very common figure in Japanese mythology at least until the 16th century. And then, suddenly, the fox was supplanted by a new magical shapeshifter, 
the Japanese raccoon dog, or Tanuki. Now you might recognize Tanuki if you've played the third installment of the Super Mario Bros. franchise. In that game, Mario would acquire a magical Tanuki fursuit that allowed him to fly and to turn into a statue. It did not, however, give him the ability to create magical illusions to lead travelers astray. And it did not give him giant testicles. Yes, you heard that right. Among the Tanuki's many interesting abilities was a gigantic scrotum which it could wear as a hat, use to pound things flat like a mallet, or even inflate and transform into a variety of shapes. We're not trying to be vulgar here. You just can't look up the Tanuki without its prominent testicles being featured in every piece of art. What's really strange is that Tanuki are real animals. They are wild canines related to foxes, but similar in appearance to raccoons. And you might wonder if real Tanuki have massive reproductive organs. The answer is no. They have nice, normal animal parts. So where did Tanuki inherit these particular features? It turns out it's all thanks to goldsmiths. See, in the 1600s, the Japanese became big fans of gold leaf. Gold leaf is extremely flat, thin layers of gold used for decoration. Basically, you take a piece of gold and pound it flat like tin foil. But to protect the gold and keep it from tearing, you wanted to wrap it in something soft while you pounded it. And whatever you wrapped it in had to be nice and stretchy so that as the gold spread out into a thin leaf, the wrapping would stretch to accommodate it. And goldsmiths in Japan discovered the soft, stretchy skin of the tanuki scrotum was perfect for the job. Over time, this found its way into folklore, not just in the form of magical testicle powers, but also in the form of superstitions. Purses made from tanuki scrotums were said to be lucky and could multiply your money, stretching it just like they were used to stretch gold. How does any of this end up in D&D? Don't worry, it doesn't have anything to do with giant magical gonads. That part was just a fun fact. What did end up in D&D back in 1985 was the basic classification of shape-shifting animal humans, the Henge Yokai. In that year, Gary Gygax published a book called Oriental Adventures that let players and DMs play D&D in a mishmash of Asian folkloric cultures, primarily Japanese. It included the Henge Yokai as a playable race and introduced classes like the Bushi, Samurai, and Ninja. But homograph or not, the word of the week is not actually Henge. It could have been. But we chose the other form, Henge. When most people hear the word hinge, they think of Stonehenge, the famous Neolithic monument. And when people think of Stonehenge, they think of a ring of standing vertical stones and cross pieces that will fall like dominoes if Clark W. Griswold backs his car into them. Assuming you remember the 1985 movie National Lampoon's European Vacation, which was itself a follow-up to a much better National Lampoon's Vacation, which was part of the National Lampoon series of parody movies that began with the absolutely hilarious 1978 National Lampoon's Animal House. But enough with dating ourselves. Stonehenge. Stonehenge was built about 5,000 years ago, during the transition between the Neolithic Age and the beginnings of the Bronze Age. We talked about the Bronze Age before. The Neolithic Age comes from the Greek words Neo, meaning new, not Keanu Reeves or the One or Christ figure, and the Greek word lithos, meaning stone. The New Stone Age, as it was called, was typified by two important developments. First, people discovered that if you shoved plant bits into the ground, they would grow into food and you didn't have to go chasing animals around the landscape and hoping you'd stumble across nuts and berries on the way. In short, it began with the serious development of agriculture. Second, it was typified by more well-constructed stone tools and weapons and the use of clay and pottery. So it was about that time that civilization stopped running around the wilderness and started settling down. And some of the earliest and easiest constructions for defense and shelter for your awesome new community was a hinge. At least in Northern Europe and Great Britain. Most people think a hinge refers to a circle of standing stones, but a hinge is actually a flattened circular area usually surrounded by a moat or ditch and an earth rampart. Basically you dug a circular ditch to enclose an area 
and piled up the dirt you dug out of the ditch into a ridge inside the moat. That made it hard for anyone, person or animal, to get across. Henges also had one, two, or four entrances. There are over 100 hinges across the British Isles and many similar constructions across Europe. Stonehenge is an unusual hinge in point of fact because the rampart is outside of the ditch for reasons unknown. The exact purpose of hinges is debated to this day, but the idea that they were used to mark astronomical events or for worship has come under intense scrutiny. Many now theorize they were simply community centers for Neolithic peoples to gather and live. Though, there are some that point out that the ditch and rampart system wasn't very well constructed for defensive purposes. That said, archaeologists have discovered pottery and fossilized remains of food like animal bones and seeds along with ash from human cremations and human skeletons inside various hinges. So hinges might have served many different purposes, like a community center. Stonehenge is also interesting because while it is famous and iconic, it is actually at the center of a far more complex complex. There are causeways, other earthworks, and burial mounds surrounding Stonehenge. In addition, there have been holes discovered around Stonehenge that imply standing timber structures might once have been part of the location. But the actual standing stones of Stonehenge, while not technically what makes it a hinge, are examples of a very common type of structure from the Neolithic and Early Bronze eras, a type of structure that is common across most of the world. They are examples of megaliths, and you can probably figure out what megalith means. Lithos means stone, mega means big, big stones. There are lots of different types of megalithic structures, and they are all constructed in basically the same way. Cut or hewn rocks are stacked, piled, or interlocked to make various structures. The simplest are monoliths, which are structures composed of one single stone. For example, you might have heard of menhirs. Those come from the old Breton words mayan, meaning stone, and her, meaning long. They are basically just single standing stone monuments. Menhirs have many different names across the world though, and they exist across Europe, in India, in Israel, Iran in the Middle East, in Africa, and even in South America. It seems like once people figured out how to cut and shape rocks and stand them up, the first thing they did was make menhirs. Unfortunately, most menhirs lack art or inscriptions or any sign, really, of what their actual purpose was. But later menhirs, ones constructed in the Iron Age and beyond, are inscribed as monuments, works of art, ritual sites, and geographical waymarkers. Interestingly enough, you might be familiar with another type of monolithic megalith. Perhaps you've heard of the Egyptian obelisk. Obelisks are tall, standing stone structures that have been smoothed out so that they have four flat sides and a pyramidal top. Have you ever seen the Washington Monument? That's an obelisk. And interestingly, a law on the books forbids any structure in Washington, D.C. from being built taller than the Washington Monument. What's interesting about obelisks, though, is that true obelisks are monoliths. They are cut from a single piece of stone, shaped, polished, moved, and erected. We know this because in Aswan, Egypt, in an ancient stone quarry, there is an unfinished obelisk still in the ground. Basically, the 140-foot-long pillar of rock lays there on its side, where they never finished cutting it out of the ground. When finished, it would have weighed 1,200 tons. By the way, even though they were Egyptian, the word obelisk comes from the Greek. It means skewer. The Egyptians called them tekken. The Greeks and the Egyptians traded a lot, and a lot of their cultures mingled. That's how alchemy and burial practices spread, as we discussed in previous episodes. And that's also how an obelisk helped the Greeks determine the circumference of the earth. Around 250 BCE, the Greek natural scientist Eratosthenes realized that an obelisk in the city of Aswan didn't cast a shadow on the longest day of the year at noon because the sun was directly overhead. But he also knew that on the same day, at the same time, in Alexandria, an obelisk did cast a shadow. For that to happen, the sun couldn't be directly above Alexandria. By measuring the length of the shadow, he could figure out at what angle sunlight was hitting Alexandria. 
and using that angular distance and the distance between the two cities, he was able to guess at how far around the world was. He guessed it was about 24,800 miles. The real answer is 24,900. So he got the answer to within half a percent. By the way, the practice of taking obelisks from Egypt and moving them around the world didn't end with the Greeks. Because obelisks were pretty awesome, and because they were often topped with gold or electrum, many were plundered. Many more were given away by the Egyptian government as gifts over the years and moved to museums or other heritage sites. The end result is that while today 28 obelisks remain standing in the world, only six are in Egypt. But we'll end with one last type of megalithic structure that can be a lot of fun in your D&D game, especially in areas ruled by primitive or barbaric peoples. Let's talk about the Passage Tomb. You might know it as a burial mound. A burial mound or barrow appears to be a low, rounded hill with a constructed entrance and a passage leading into one or more burial chambers. But in truth, most weren't hills at all. They are buried megalithic structures. A passage tomb begins as a flat piece of land. You get a whole bunch of big rocks and you stack them into a rectangular wall around, say, a hallway or a passage. You lay some more big rocks over the top to close up the structure like a ceiling. Then you bury the whole thing under a mound of dirt. Over time, grass and plants grow over the hill. Passage Tomb The simplest passage tomb consisted of a single room at the heart of the mound and a hallway that led into it. But the most common and most complex was the cruciform passage tomb. Cruciform means cross-shaped. The passage leads to a four-way intersection in the heart of the hill and each hall ends at a burial chamber. So there were three burial chambers and an entrance passage. Passage tombs are also called tumuli, which is the plural of tumulus, or burial mounds or kurgans or barrows. Contrast this with a sepulcher, which is a cave that is cut or dug out of the rock to make a tomb or burial chamber. Both sepulchers and passage tombs could have large rocks rolled in front of the entrance to seal them. So how can you use all of this in your game? Well, first of all, stop using the word hinge to mean a circle of standing stones. Standing stones are standing stones. Hinges are ancient circular plazas protected by a ditch. Next, start thinking about the purpose for these things in your world. In a world of magic, menhirs and monoliths could be runic stones used to mark or even control the flow of magic across the world. Or they could be raised for particular gods, and they might have certain powers or be useful in various rituals. For example, in the Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim, there were standing stones all around the world you could attune with to enjoy certain blessings and bonuses. Imagine if only one individual at a time could be attuned to the most powerful ones. Imagine the stories that would grow out of controlling those stones. Or, you can dig up a copy of Oriental Adventures and fill your world with shape-shifting magical animal spirits. With or without giant testicles. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.